today we're watching Better Call Saul. How accurate even is it? Let's check it out. Thanks to the sponsor of today's video, DataCamp. So maybe the law isn't for you, but you're looking to grow your career and stand out professionally. A great way to do so is by learning skills in data, because companies, both tech and non-tech, are realizing how important it is to use data in order to grow and be successful. So they're looking for data professionals right now to give them a leg up. And you can get in on it thanks to DataCamp, an online learning platform that makes acquiring data skills easy and convenient. For example, companies large and small are hiring data analysts, and with great starting pay, I might add. I literally just saw a TikTok the other day where a data analyst said that all she did to get started was to learn SQL for data analysis and Tableau for data visualization. And having those skills listed on her LinkedIn led to a career in data analysis and a salary that she's grown to six figures. You can learn both SQL and Tableau with DataCamp. They also gamify the entire learning experience, which makes learning easier and more fun. So you can unlock new career opportunities and become data fluent today with DataCamp. Use my link in the description down below and check out the first chapter of any DataCamp course completely free. Maybe Saul would have been better off if he had just learned some data skills. I love how accurate they get the vibe, like the quiet, the lighting, the mundanity of just being a lawyer. Truly, really, it's a lot of like sitting around in silence or listening to or reading testimony or sitting around waiting for court to begin. It's mostly really boring. Oh, to be 19 again. You with me, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> okay, that's not how you start a trial. This looks like opening arguments, and usually there has to be a bunch of like announcements that the judge makes, and then the judge gives the attorney the go-ahead to do opening statements. These three knuckleheads, and I'm sorry, boys, but that's what you are. They did a dumb thing. We're not denying that. However, I would like you to remember, nobody got hurt, not a soul. Very important to keep that in mind. These three young men, near honors students all were feeling their oats one Saturday night and they just went a little bananas. Yikes, that was a <laughs> rough opening argument. Yeah, probably shouldn't call your clients knuckleheads. All right. So this is a criminal trespass case in New Mexico. The criminal trespass law says that criminal trespass consists of knowingly entering or remaining upon posted private property without possessing written permission from the owner or person in control of the land. Just because nobody got hurt doesn't really matter in a criminal trespass situation, though I guess it could be used to argue for a more lenient sentence, but it's not relevant to whether or not the criminal trespass like actually occurred. Ladies and gentlemen, you're bigger than that. So we learned in my Jody Arias video that it's generally bad conduct to try to like appeal to the jury's intelligence and integrity and trying to convince them to find for your client. Like the integrity and intelligence of the jury is not an issue and it isn't really proper to bring it up in closing arguments. So I'd probably object to that if I were the prosecutor. Paid up, run it again. <laughs> Ow, what the hell, man? Listen, Starlight Express, I'm gonna give you a 9.6 for technique, 0.0 .0 for choice of victim. I'm a lawyer. Furthermore, does does a steaming pile of crap scream payday to you, huh? Well, listen, that's thinking like a lawyer. Trying to sue someone with no money is a losing battle, even if you take them to court and you get a ruling in your favor. If they don't have the money to pay, then it's a waste of everyone's time because you won't get the money because they don't have it and you'll be out attorney's fees. Howard brought this. He's concerned. Well, you have to admit it could be confusing. Hamlin Hamlin McGill, James M. McGill, that's my name. I was born with it. I... Still. What's he gonna do? Sue Mia? Nobody wants to create an adversarial situation. It's simply a matter of professional courtesy. I gotta say, that's an empty threat. This is a trademark issue. You can't obtain trademark rights in a surname unless you've acquired distinctiveness in your brand. Meaning that when a consumer sees the surname, McGill in this case, they know the brand right away. Something tells me that the name McGill doesn't immediately call up this HHM big firms brand, especially considering the fact that when you Google McGill, there are a bunch of other companies and brands that also pop up in related fields. So Jimmy's fine. This guy's full of shit. Break their legs. <laughs> How many legs? Two, they got two legs. One leg. Each one leg each? <laughs> one leg each. That total of two legs. <laughs> uh, hey, look, <laughs> they can't skateboard for six months and they're scared of you forever. No. You show everybody that you are the man, but that you're fair, that you're just. One leg each. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's tough. That's fair. <laughs> okay. Advising someone to break the law, which this is breaking the law. This is criminal assault. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that this is an ethics violation in every single state in the union. But I will say he does have a way of talking to his clients and meeting them where they're at, which I guess is pretty admirable. <laughs> Mr. Berger, we've met before, haven't we? Mr. Edison, like the inventor? I'm James McGill. I'll be your lawyer. The hell kind of math is that? 700 per defense. No, no, no. Defendant. Yeah. Dent. Listen, the work that public defenders do is truly invaluable. It's important. Everyone deserves competent representation. But I've never worked in a public defender's office, so I don't know how they work. But I'm pretty sure that the $700 per client is not the case for everyone. I know the public defender program here in Minneapolis, where I live, for example, it's one of the best funded in the country, and they start around $60,000. And I looked at the public defender website in New Mexico, and the starting salary for a New Mexico public defender looks to be about $53,000. So. I don't know uh, what this setup is that they're depicting, but I'm pretty sure this show actually is set in 2002, which somehow is 20 years ago. <laughs> so maybe they did it differently back then. Okay, so the Cattlemen's are a political family. They're accused of stealing and embezzling money, and they have been apparently abducted. And Saul, AKA Jimmy, he kind of egged on this guy Nacho to go steal their money because Jimmy wants the Cattlemen's business. So now Nacho is under arrest for their apparent abduction. You guys are cops. I got bad knees. Ow! Oh! Uh, uh, come on, officers, you're making a mistake. My name's McGill. James McGill. I'm an attorney. Easy, easy. This is lawyer. Who's lawyer? <laughs> I don't know why they're like chasing him down like this if he's just like somebody's lawyer. <laughs> you get me out of here today or you're a dead man. That's bad. But when you get arrested like that, you don't get out the same day. It's for a violent crime. Like you're not gonna be let out on bail. So I guess Jimmy's a dead man. He's really forcing my hand here. Okay, so that could probably be considered trademark infringement and unfair trade practices. I think if HHM were to bring that before a judge, it wouldn't take much of any persuasion to get an injunction against Jimmy's use of that branding. I mean, like, that's pretty obvious. Well, back up. Hamlindigo Blue? Yes, that is our trademark name. <laughs> Holy crap. You seriously named a color Hamlindigo? That is... yikes. All right, yes. You are within your rights to advertise using your own name. However, in my estimation, the billboard clearly and intentionally duplicates elements of the Hamlin Hamlin McKill logo. You're actively copying their established brand for your own gain. I don't see any other reasonable explanation. Your Honor. Jimmy, I Jimmy, wise up. You can trademark a color, but it's pretty difficult and only a few companies have successfully done so. For example, Tiffany's Blue, trademarked. There's no way that HHM, this big firm, has established such inherent distinction in that color, meaning that when consumers see the color, they know the brand right away to warrant protection for the color. But I still think that's a good call on the judge's part. It's blatant copying. Like there's not much argument that it's not. You think the billboard thing was unethical? It was promotion. It was advertising. That's all. Which wasn't even allowed until five Supreme Court justices went completely bonkers in Bates versus State Bar of Arizona. Aha! Uh -huh. But in any event, it's legal. Okay, so this is true. Prior to this 1977 Supreme Court case called Bates v. State Bar of Arizona, the Arizona Bar banned attorneys from advertising their services, like flat out. And this lawyer, Bates, wanted to advertise, so he challenged this Arizona Bar rule, saying that it violated his free speech rights, and the Supreme Court agreed in a 5-4 decision. They said that even commercial speech merits First Amendment protection because it serves an important function in society, like providing consumers with information about services and products. They also say that it allocates 
allocates resources in the American system of free enterprise. They went on to say that allowing attorneys to advertise would not harm the legal profession or administration of justice, and would in fact supply consumers with valuable information about the availability and cost of legal services. And listen, as much as I like to roll my eyes at the poor branding choices of lawyers, and we all get a good chuckle out of how tacky Saul is here and in Breaking Bad, I think it's a fair point and it goes towards why I started this whole channel to begin with. The law is inaccessible. I get tons of questions from people about their legal position and what they should do. And usually I can't give them any legal advice, but I just tell them how to go about finding the right lawyer for them. I really need to do a whole video on this, but yeah, the big wig lawyers and their giant firms, they don't do much advertising because they're so entrenched in big business and everyone there knows how it all works and has the money to throw at a bunch of lawyers. But your average Joe really doesn't know what to do when they get into a legal predicament. So they go where they've been advertised to. Now, of course we have restrictions on advertising and lawyers can't pay referral fees, you know, like paying someone to recommend them, for example. And there are questionable practices that lawyers follow, which give them the ambulance chaser bad rap. But I think generally speaking, the reasoning behind Bates v. State Bar of Arizona rings true still. Okay, so in the end, the Kettlemans weren't abducted. They had a camping trip to avoid getting caught, but now they're in big trouble and they hired HHM, that big fancy firm, to help defend them in this embezzlement case against them. We're not in a great position to win at trial. But we came to you people because we were told you win cases. Winning doesn't always mean getting a favorable verdict at trial. We try to achieve the best possible outcome for our clients given each individual case. Frankly, we've worked very hard to stave off an arrest after the misunderstanding about your uh, camping trip. The DA was concerned you might be a flight risk. Their lawyer is Liz Wexler at HHM, who by the way, has great sexual tension with Saul, AKA Jimmy. And if they don't get it on at some point in this series, I will be disappointed. Anyway, so she told them that they needed to accept a plea agreement from the prosecutor that would lead to a short jail time for the husband because they don't stand a chance at winning at trial and they could go to prison for a very long time. But they got mad at her because they don't want to admit that they did anything wrong. So the Kettleman's decide to hire Jimmy back, which is funny because they said that he's the kind of lawyer that guilty people hire and now here we are. I honestly think this was really well written and I think it sounds like the type of advice that a lawyer is going to give you in that scenario. Like she's clearly done her research. She's gotten them a pretty spectacular deal from the DA. It's about as reasonable as it can get and this is pretty realistic. However, I will say in my experience, big lawyers and big law firms tend to prefer to play it safe whereas smaller attorneys and solo practitioners sometimes are more willing to take risks and take on the big guy, you know, like David and Goliath type lawyering. Whether they're smart risks or not varies greatly, but this trope you can see play out in a number of places. I'm thinking specifically of Aaron Brockovich, which I did a reaction video to that I'll link to. That was a small law firm that was willing to take on a huge corporation and represent a bunch of people in this huge class action lawsuit that didn't seem winnable. The bar exam's a mother. I mean, for me, it was. I Failed it the first two times, but I guess it's like losing your virginity. Third time's the charm. <laughs> the University of American Samoa. Uh, they're accredited. Go land crabs. I was hoping, you know, if you think it's appropriate, um, once I get sworn in and everything, consider hiring me. As what? Honestly, this is pretty accurate. The reality is that going to a bottom rung law school means that your opportunities are few and far between when it comes to big law firm work or traditional legal work. Now, I'm all about access to legal education and I think that prestige in the legal profession can be a whole heap of baloney and is super exclusionary, but there are some predatory for-profit law schools out there that really take advantage of people's dreams by charging them a crap ton of money for an extremely subpar degree. The University of American Samoa Law School is not a real thing, though you can buy a branded sweatshirt shirt on Amazon, which is fun. Yeah, I bought it. It is, however, possible to get a legal education part-time and doing it remotely now is much easier thanks to the pandemic. Come on now, sir. I've been very patient. Clear pattern of malfeasance. Abuses are negligent infliction of emotional distress. Sir, I really need you to finish up and come out now. Contact by the end of the week or I will be forced to move forward. Sir, I need you to this finish up. This is a up. demand letter informing Sandpiper Crossing of pending litigation for defrauding my clients through systematic overcharging. You're shredding in there. I'm not deaf. I can hear you. Stop right now. 
this year, this makes it official, right? If you don't stop shredding right now, that's destruction of evidence. Spoliation, that's what it's called. Okay, so what he's doing is writing a spoliation letter, which is a real thing. It puts a party on notice of pending litigation and tells them not to destroy any relevant evidence, either on purpose or as just a regular course of business. I'd imagine that just because this is written on toilet paper doesn't automatically mean that it's not proper notice, though I'm unclear whether that's actually legibly written, which may be another question. It is true that participating in spoliation that is destroying evidence can lead to serious jail time. Look something up for me on Westlaw. Please. You are lucky I'm gonna push over. All right. Hit me. Thank you. So Jimmy is calling her because she works at a big firm and has access to Westlaw, which is an online database of cases, and it's the standard research tool that lawyers use. It also costs a ton of money to access. So it's often out of reach for small law firms and individual attorneys. Even though Westlaw is literally just giving online access to publicly available materials, but it's a service, it's fine. A conversation about the inaccessibility of allegedly publicly available documents is another question for another day. What, you want me to just redo the head notes or something? No, no, print it. Full cases and any cases that cite to those cases. Shepherdize like the wolves at the door. So head notes are blocks of text that Westlaw puts at the beginning of cases to help capture categorize them with other similar cases and statutes and to help quickly identify the rule of law included in the cases. Shepherdizing is a process of making sure that the case or statute that you're relying on, like say you find a case or a statute that supports your argument, you shepherdize that case or statute to make sure that there is no other case out there that overruled the holding in this case or that changed what the case or statute means. Because if you go before a judge and say, look, this case supports what we're saying and the judge is like, that's not good law, it was overruled last year, it's really embarrassing. This happened live on air to Marsha Clark during the O.J. Simpson trial, and honestly, watching the clip makes me want to crawl out of my skin. Doesn't the case law dealing with that particular code section include criminal cases? If you shepherdize that, you come up with some criminal we cases. We did. I believe that none were found, Your Honor. I didn't... We don't have any in our motion. So if my Pepperdine law clerks found some... Did they? Criminal cases? And what did they say? That is the horror story that legal research and writing professors show their students to emphasize the importance of shepherdizing. What, what is it? They served interrogatories on each class representative. Uh, this box is deposition notices, documents calling into question the mental health of many of our elderly clients attempting to stop the class from being certified on the grounds they're not competent to file. Okay, that was a lot. So basically what this means is that they're in the discovery phase. Discovery happens after the initial lawsuit has been filed, and it's when the parties get all of the information and evidence that they can from each side. One way they do this is through interrogatories, which is just a fancy word for a list of questions that each side sends each other. That's it, it's, it's just a list of questions. And then both sides have to respond to each question or object to them if they feel that a question is improper for some reason. They also gather evidence and information through depositions, which is where they have key witnesses show up along with their lawyer and a court reporter, and they ask a series of questions during which time the deponents, that's the person having their deposition taken, their lawyer will object to improper questions. It's a way of getting a record of the evidence that can then be theoretically used at trial, though there are rules of evidence which may bar parts of the deposition testimony. All right, and then he mentions class certification. So they're dealing with a huge group of people. They said eventually over 300 people would be named. In that situation, it's often preferable to lump them all into one group or class. And then if they win the case, then everyone wins. However, if they lose, then everyone included in the class loses the right to bring their own individual cases. So it's a great way for someone who wouldn't normally have the resources to bring a lawsuit or maybe didn't even know it was happening to still have their rights enforced. However, it also means that you lose the right to bring a separate case. So certifying a class, meaning allowing the case to move forward as a class action lawsuit, is taken very seriously. If the class does get certified, then they'll have to notify everyone in the class. This is a requirement, and it's why sometimes you get letters in the mail asking if you'd like to opt out of a class action lawsuit. For example, I got noticed recently about a class action lawsuit involving Wells Fargo car loans, which I had, and I was like, hell yes. And then a while later, I got a $90 check in the mail for doing absolutely nothing. Thanks, class action lawyers. All of these papers would be digital now, but that is an accurate representation of just the quantity of paperwork that you might be served in a case of this size. It's called complex litigation for a reason. At any point, it's too much, you're uncomfortable, we'll turn around and come home. You want maybe like a safe word? Am I sexually attracted to Saul Goodman in this moment? I'm not a bad guy. I didn't say you're a bad guy, I said you're a criminal. 
What's the difference? I've known good criminals and bad cops. Bad priests, honorable thieves. You can be on one side of the law or the other. I love that. That is a perfect summation of the gray area of the law and crime and what we deem to be criminal and who we deem to be criminal. I kind of love this show. You're not a real lawyer. University of American Samoa, for Christ's sake, an online course? What a joke. I worked my ass off to get where I am. There it is. This is why. This is some real classic elitist bullshit, my friends. I loved that. That encapsulated everything that pisses me off about lawyers and the legal profession. That was good. This is the literal reason why I started this channel. The law is not rocket science. Yes, it's something to be respected, but this elitism keeps people out who could learn or who want to learn or who deserve access. But the point is you need a good front. So you're gonna have the most return on your dollars. But I know this customs officer. The money then, yeah. make it an investment. The price it's, is right. And I'm all about investments. It's all about what's coming next. Hey kid, help me get my wife's car to this bad neighborhood. Sir. Sir, could you help me tell me, are these today's numbers? Okay, so this is called fraud. <laughs> so fraud is a false statement made with intent to deceive the victim. The victim relies on that false statement and then suffers damages as a result. And that's what they're doing here. And fraud is taken very seriously if you're caught and you're a lawyer because it indicates untruthfulness, that you're a liar. And contrary to pretty much everything you've probably ever been taught about lawyers, we don't want lawyers who are liars. <laughs> I appreciate your attention to detail. You need to write any of this down because it's okay if you do. Ooh, this is giving me some flashbacks to my big law days. <laughs> you gotta be king of the desert driving around town in a white caddy making bank. I'm not making bank. I'm making a living, more or less. A living? All due respect, you're a lawyer and you're not making bank. You're doing it wrong. Yeah really true. <laughs> there are many lawyers doing great work making like 30k a year. So just because someone's a lawyer doesn't necessarily mean that they're rich and becoming a lawyer doesn't guarantee that you'll get rich. And if this show has taught us anything is that being a lawyer can take many different forms. Okay, honestly, if I were to give this a rating 10 out of 10. Sorry, I love this show. It's like not 100% accurate, but like it's clear that they actually consulted with a lawyer or two in the writing of this show, which is more than I can say for some of the legal dramas I've watched. <laughs> Shonda Rhimes. <clears throat> but if you'd like to see me react to how to get away with murder, you can do so here and here. And don't forget to hit that like button for the algorithm and subscribe if you want to hear more from me. Thanks again to Data Camp for sponsoring today's video. Check out the link in the description below and take the first chapter of any Data Camp course for free. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Goodbye.